Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here and I thought I would sit down and do a video for you guys and gals. Let me get a sip of my water first. Get my beautiful radio voice going. Lower the forearms. Forearms are okay. And get some more carbs in today. I'm not baby enough. All right, the, I'm going to discuss something and there's a reason I'm going to discuss this because this creates a problem and a bias and a measurement in the research. Okay, because research is not unbiased. And it's going to come down to a simple fact that if you have researchers themselves who train, who do not appear to know what muscle failure or getting close to muscle failure even is in their own training, how are they going to define it in the lab with their test subjects? And this is one reason I think there's a problem with some of this volume data, because it doesn't work in the real world. Like all of us who are coaches and people who observe this and even looked at older studies, you're like, none of this works. And it's one circle of researchers and groups that are putting out all this, this data that's conflicting, but they're so big and so popular that it's everywhere. And this is problematic. It's a problem with data collection. Um, and, you know, a couple of them I'll mention, and others have said there's others, but I mean, it would be uh, Dr. Schoenfeld and then uh, Minnow. And, you know, this is a conversation I had with Minnow years ago, what, like 10 years ago? Because I, I got into it with Ian over the same thing. And, and I told Minnow, we got an argument over back stuff. And he's like, and I'm like, bros and deadlifts, build your back just fine. It's got to go heavy and go hard. And he's just like, well, I got up to these lifts. And I, it's like, well, you, you were lifting girl weight. I mean, I'm sorry. And the fact of the matter is, when you saw him train, and I just flat out called it then, and I'll call it today, I was like, Minnow, you train like an effing pussy. There is there is no intensity. There is no effort. Your sets are like 17 reps from failure. Like nothing you do is even an effective rep. Well, no wonder you need 30, 40 sets to see a minuscule amount of muscle growth. I mean, not not trying to be a dick here, but again, we look at what's written in these protocols and in these studies, and then you watch what the researchers do, and they are not doing what they are actually talking about. This is a problem, uh, particularly when it comes to Schoenfeld, because someone brought that up today, uh, in, I think in my comments, and I went and checked it out. People are like, you know, you watch Brad train, and I'm sorry, Dr. Schoenfeld, I will, I will be polite here be respectful. Uh, Dr. Schoenfeld will say, well, that is failure for me. And I'm looking at it going, you're nowhere near muscle failure. I went and watched him do about eight different exercises. They're all on machines and cables. And that's cool. You know what I was doing a hypertrophy thing. I can accept that even though I prefer mostly free weights with a little bit of machines. Um, it was all cables, all machines. But when I watched the sets, there, there was no rep in any of those sets. I watched a bunch of them, about seven or eight exercises. And he would say, well, this is hard since these are training to failure. It's my failure. I don't think he did a single exercise within three to four reps of failure. Not one. Not one. And I checked. I mean, okay, I check one or two. That's a poor sample. I start looking at six, seven, eight. And I don't see a single challenging rep to where it looked like he reached the highest threshold motor units. The bar speed slowed. And he was a little shaking a little bit, right? We all know what happens when you're a rep from failure or two reps from failure. The cadence changes. Even on a machine, there's going to, and I didn't see it happening anywhere. Okay. I mean, he maintained a great smooth tempo as we would expect on machines, but there was a sheer lack of intensity. But then, and it would be fine if he said, well, I'm getting older and I don't care about gains. That would be fine. But when he has said, this is close to failure, this is failure. When it's clearly, visually to me as a coach, clearly not, clearly not. So this is a problem because who is leading the charge with all this volume research? This is the person leading the whole charge. This is the pretty much the king and you have to kiss his ring sometimes to even get the proper grants or speaking engagements. And this is how he trains and this is what he calls challenging hard sets. 
in that context, if that is the same criteria by which he is using, okay, if that is his professional opinion, not just his personal bias, because maybe he doesn't train hard, his professional opinion, if that professional opinion is being carried over into the research, no wonder there are people doing 30 sets for their legs and not dying. Well, no wonder. What would happen if any of his, his, his test subjects actually did five really, really, really hard sets for their legs? Like on a full squat, a full range of motion leg press? What if they did five actual sets to failure at any point in these protocols? And then you try to compare their numbers. I think it would, it would completely change the data. It would match. The other studies that have looked at sets to failure or very close to failure, it would match. And it's the same as my, I, I predict. Okay. This is a problem. It's a big problem because he's displaying the lifts and then showing, well, if that is the same intensity to which your test subjects are being held to, and then we're going to talk about quality, quality sets for volume. We've got a data problem now. Because those are warm-up sets. People are doing 52 warm-up sets and they got some muscle growth. See the issue here? And here's the problem with this too. If we go off the data we have and they're saying, well, this is close to, okay, but you're not doing sets to failure. What does the research say? Let's go with what the research says. What's the research show on people's guessing their proximity to failure? It's really bad. You know, the studies have shown that even in trained people with a couple years of training experience, 80% of people cannot guess their number of reps from failure in the lab. They cannot actually guess it. They'll try to guess it and they will make them go to failure. When they're saying, oh, I think I'm one rep from failure, 80% of them are more than one rep, quite a bit more. In some cases, at least some test subjects have shown as many as seven or eight reps away from failure still. Isn't that what we're observing when these guys train? Isn't that what we're seeing? And it comes back to the point I've made before, this is a problem with the evidence-based circles and why they lose to the rows. A lot of the evidence-based guys who get into it are lazy. They're intelligent, but they are lazy. And when it comes to their training, they're looking for biohacks to find any way around actually just training harder. They're looking for any excuse. Instead of just saying, maybe I should do some really hard sets. Maybe I should put some really heavy weight on the bar. Otherwise, you wouldn't have people saying, hey, let's see if we can try occlusion training for 40 and 50 rep sets and use an even lighter weight than we would normally use for 40 or 50 sets and tie tourniquets around our arms and legs. Instead of doing a heavy 8 to 10 rep set, you know. And then it catches on in these circles. Just, again, this should tell you everything that you need to know. They're that scared of actually putting any weight on the bar and risking muscle failure with a moderately heavy weight that these are the extremes these people go to and will then endorse this sort of stuff. Do you see where we're going with this? And they're not even thinking about, hey, well, what if I'm doing all these really, really high... They're not even thinking in terms of all the fatigue all the peripheral fatigue, nervous system fatigue, systemic fatigue, all this fatigue that you are creating from doing this. You know, instead of saying, hey, if I just train really hard, I won't have to do as much. I'm careful with it if I end up with better recovery and lower injuries. Just throwing that out there. Just my opinion, says me. Um, and that's what I mean by there's problems with, with some of this, the volume data. This, the problem is if the re best researchers and speakers in the area who are 
doing the studies don't even know what a hard set looks like when they do it themselves. They can't even tell. In what world can we expect them to measure it in the lab with other people? How then are we supposed to say their data is good when it conflicts with everything that we have observed for the past 30 or 40 years in the gym as coaches? All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys and gals next time.